now, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 it's perfect. Yeah, so, okay, so um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks, Ravada, for the introduction. Um, so, uh, as Ravada said, this is going to be about predicting the quality of machine translation. So, in some ways, it's related to the lecture that uh, Maya Popovich gave a couple of days ago, but you see that there is one fundamental difference, which is the fact that we don't use references in this case. So, um, I'm going to start with a, a brief overview of why, why this is important uh, and what the problems are with the current uh, or the most predominant evaluation methods that we have nowadays, um, and then talk, to, talk about quality estimation itself to a certain level of detail, and finish with uh, some new work that has been um, using the output of new machine translation for prediction, but also using interesting newer models as, as prediction models. So let's get started. So talking about translation evaluation, again, this is going to be similar to what Maya probably covered. Um, why do we care about evaluating the quality of uh, the output of MT systems? Well, as, as MT developers um, in both research and industry, you would want to know how well your systems are doing and especially to measure progress over time or compare different alternatives of the same system, uh, compare different systems. Um, depending on the type of MT architecture that you use, you may also need a metric to optimize the parameters of the, the system. Um, and you also may be interested in more like um, diagnosis level evaluation, which is one of the things Maya covered, so knowing exactly where the system is going wrong. Um, and then finally also on deciding whether certain translations are good enough for some task, whatever the task is, um, whatever you define it to be. So in, in all of these cases, the critical word is, is quality. Um, but what do we mean by quality? Uh, well, this is not um, a very well-defined concept in terms of in, in, in the area of machine translation, uh, mostly because there isn't a single output for a given input that is uh, can be said to have good quality. So you could have multiple outputs that are good um, and at different levels of goodness. So this is a complex question. Um, and even if you, if you know more or less what uh, level of quality you want, what are the dimensions of quality that you're interested in? Is it a fluency or is it adequacy or is it both? Or is it a translation that is easy to post edit? So if you're giving it to a professional translator, they'll be able to fix it quickly. Um, or is it a, a way of comparing different systems? And there could be many other questions here. Um, the other way of looking at quality is um, what is it for or whom is it for? So um, you could have quality um, in the sense of what's the end user? Uh, is it going to be a, a gisting sort of use of the translation, like in, in Google Translate when you're just um, reading something that you don't understand the source language? Or does it need to be perfect quality for dissemination? Um, or is the user a post editor? And if so, are you going to be doing light or heavy post editing? So just fixing what is really wrong or fixing it so it's perfect even according to style? Um, or are you going to use it for other applications, such as cross-lingual information retrieval? And then the metric there is actually a metric um, of information retrieval. Um, and then are you going to use it for the MT system as your end user for either selecting different systems or tuning the system or diagnosing problems and so on? So there are all these complex questions that uh, one needs to at least think about when, when deciding um, what quality means in a context and um, <laughs> what it's going to be what the translations are going to be used for. So just to give you an example um, of why this is a complex problem, say you have this as an output of a, an MT system. Uh, do by this product is um, their craziest invention. And say your reference says almost the same thing, but there is a negation there that is different. Um, so how good would you say this machine translation is? It's only missing one word, only got one word wrong, uh, but it happens to be a critical word. So again, it depends on what you want to use this translation for. So this would be a very severe type of error if you have an end user who cannot read the source language, so missing that negation changes the meaning of the sentence completely, or it would be a very trivial error to edit if you're actually having 
translators post editing the translation so they, they can read the source and they're going to see very quickly that there's only one word missing and they can add that word very quickly. A sort of contrary example is this, where you have a sentence that is very disfluent, six hours battery, 30 minutes to full charge last. You can kind of get what the meaning is um, and uh, basically means you have a um, battery that lasts six hours and it takes 30 minutes to fully charge. And actually that's what the reference says and the colors are just indicating the, the correspondences there. Um, again, how, how good or how bad is this MT output? Well, if it's going to be used for gisting, it's probably fine because we can still get the mini, but if it needs to be fixed so that it's a perfect um, translation, then it's going to be very costly because there's a lot of things that need to be done, reorderings, um, changes in, in morphology and so on. So this is not a good translation for post-editing. Um, so, as I said, this is a complex problem. There has been work in evaluation of machine translation for a very, very long time. Uh, there is this quote, quote from uh, 91 that says the, the MT evaluation is better understood than MT itself. Um, I disagree with that now and I disagreed with that back then as well, uh, except that I wasn't really doing any research, but um, I would have disagreed. Even though back then the, the systems were still rules-based, um, with statistical systems, um, just like a theoretical sort of model. Um, but I don't think MT evaluation is very well understood and that's um, why there are so many ways of doing it. And this is my attempt to kind of categorize all of these ways. I'm not going to cover all of them, um, especially I'm not going to cover the manual assessment uh, me methods. But you probably heard that there are many different ways of, of evaluating a translation, either by having humans going through the output and scoring or ranking or finding errors or spotting errors um, or fixing the translation or reading the translation and answering questions or reading the translations and having their um, eye movements tracked by a device so that you can see in which words you're spending more time and, and so on. Um, and then you've also already seen in the second set there, in the green set, that there are um, many, many ways of doing this uh, automatically or attempting to do some of this automatically. And there are hundreds of metrics, blue, meteor, NAST, uh, TR, and so on, which basically compare the output of an empty system against one or more human translations, the so-called reference translations. And, and this is what I believe Maya has covered, including uh, error spotting based on reference translations. And then there's a category that I'm actually focusing on, which is quality estimation, which is a way of doing evaluation automatically, um, but without using reference translations. So why, why do we want to do this without a reference translation? It's, it's sort of the intuition of uh, reference-based metrics is, is kind of clear. Um, but there are some problems with it, and we're going to go very briefly through, through these problems. Um, just let's, let's start with an example. So the assumption that all of these metrics, all of these reference-based metrics uh, follow is that the closer the MT system output is to a human translation, the better it is. And, and that kind of makes sense. Um, say you have these two MT outputs, MT1 and 2, and then you have this human translation, which is a reference. And I've highlighted here the things that match. So basically what all of these metrics are doing is sort of trying to match the words in the MT with the words in the human translation. Some will allow for some flexibility, like matching synonyms. Um, word order is covered by looking at sequences of words rather than just individual words. But um, it's basically what's it, what they're doing is a word match um, uh, method, which to some extent it makes sense. You can see if there are more words that appear in the reference in, in a given translation, it's probably better. Um, but it's not always the case. In this case, the two translations are, in my opinion, as uh, in, equally good. Um, you'd get a better score for MT2 because there are more words matching, but they're equally good. Um, the question then is that um, which one is better or also how much better or just how good the one of each of these uh, individual empty uh, outputs are. And these metrics will give you a number which may or may not be very interpretable. And the number could be, for example, the proportion of words that match. 
uh, or the proportion that word, of words that do not match, which would be a, a, a word error rate metric. Um, and then the one component that you can add is that you can have multiple references, so multiple human translations, and that helps a bit because you're more likely to get things like synonyms, but you end up doing things like mix and match between one empty output and multiple references. And that doesn't really give you a full picture on whether or not the translations are good enough or good for some purpose. And one, one of the reasons for that is that the references play a very important role. Um, first of all, you should have multiple references, but in practice, it's very expensive to collect multiple references. So we end up with generally just one. And then we have this problem that we call a bias in reference-based evaluation, which is the fact that if, depending on which reference you have, um, and, and assuming that all references are good, they're all created by humans, but depending on which reference you use, you may get a very different score from each of these metrics, as well as you would from a human translator. So this was an experiment that we did. Um, if you look at the, um, the table there, so we have the empty output for some Chinese uh, sentence, and then we have four um, professionally created reference translations in green, and if you look at the blue scores, blue being the most popularly used metric, you see that um, one of them is certainly the best or the better one, or the best one among the four. Um, and the same according to human score. Um, it has a much, the higher the better here for the human score. But actually, all of these references are correct. They are all created independently for the same source sentence. Um, and it just happens that one of them is sort of more literal and the MT system also produced a more literal translation. So there is a, a very strong problem here, which is depending on what kind of reference you have, your scores will be very different. The other issue that we have with reference-based evaluation is that they completely disregard the source segment. So we are only looking at, we are only comparing the MT output to the reference, um, whereas so in some cases, uh, things will not be completely clear in the reference, even though it's a correct reference, and you need to read the source segment to understand what the reference actually means. Um, again, it's not clear what quality means in this context. What does a blue score of 0 0.427 mean? Um, is, is we know it goes from 0 to 1, but uh, what is it, the, the top performance that we can expect here? And what's the average performance? So it's very hard to tell. Um, and finally, and this is actually the most important uh, motivation for doing quality estimation, is that if you use a reference-based uh, translation evaluation, you obviously cannot do that um, if you're using a system and you want to get a, a quality score for that system. You wouldn't have pre-created reference for all of the possible texts that you want to translate. So this only works if you have a predefined created test set which you're using for comparing systems or testing a given system. But as soon as you submit a new translation that hasn't been seen in this test set, you wouldn't have any clue about the what a reference would be for that. You'd need to get a human to create it. But uh, if you're trying to use a machine translation system that already exists, uh, you're trying to avoid human translation. So that doesn't make sense. So in my case and in my opinion, this is the main motivation for quality estimation metrics that you actually need something that can run uh, for systems in use at runtime, say Google Translate uh, online. Right, so let's um, get started with quality estimation. Um, so a bit of motivation. So we have, a, um, in this case, machine translation text, which um, it's actually two sentences, happens to be very long. Um, and if you're if you're reading this, first of all, it would take you a while to just get read it all and parse it and understand if there are errors. And then to make a judgment, you'd have to read the source text as well, which in this case is, is Spanish, Spanish, sorry. And just as a starting point, it would take you a while to understand whether or not the translation is correct and where the errors are and um, if you can do anything about it. So time is already a critical issue, the time that it takes you to read a translation before you decide if you can actually use it. The other important issue is um, 
that in some cases the reader doesn't really speak the source language so you get some some chinese text and you want to translate it and you use whatever online system google and then you get this uh top translation here which says something about sex education um and it looks like a fluent sentence but if you could read the chinese you would actually know that it doesn't actually involve anything about sex education it has education but not um, sex education so the reference it's completely different um, same with this one translated from um, Hindi. So on top you read something that looks fluent and possible. The road boy caught it a friend, Indian Robin Hood, killed the poor after 32 years of prosecution. Um, but if you read reference, you'd see, you'd see that the meaning is actually completely different. Um, these are real translations taken from a while ago when the systems, in this case Google Translate, still use the statistical models. Right, so so we need quality estimation because we want to be able to provide a quality score on the fly for translations that haven't been seen before. Um, and this allows us to define what we mean by quality based on the data that we use to build these models. Um, so the purpose is a bit clear. Um, there are no comparisons with references and the source can be considered depending on how you model your, your quality estimation problem. Um, and then quality could mean whatever your data tells you. Um, and I'm talking about data because this is often modeled as a supervised machine learning task. So you need some label data. And that's basically what defines uh, quality in this case. So quality could be a binary decision. Um, is it good enough for publishing as is? Um, it could be another type of binary decision. Can the reader get the gist of it? So we're only interested in, in the meaning here, not so much in fluency. Um, or again, the binary decision, is it worth post-editing this? Or is it going to be more effort to post-edit and translate from scratch? Um, or it could be a, sort of a more continuous kind of score where is, quality means how much effort it will be needed to fix this. And it could be many other things, depending on the problem. So the, the general framework um, as I said, it's, it's basically a machine learning uh, task, uh, which we tend to model um, using supervision. So you have examples of translations um, that have been produced automatically. So it could be documents or sentences or anything. It doesn't matter the level of granularity yet, but you have pairs of source text and their uh, machine translations that are parallel. Um, you extract uh, features from this. And again, if you have a neuro approach here, then of course this will be slightly different, but you can think of the neuro approach extracting the features for you. Um, and then you have your favorite machine learning algorithm that you apply, and it is learning from some labels that could be human labels, such as a score from one to four, or uh, it could be even an automatic label such as blue, uh, or any other metric that which means that basically at training time you have some reference translations that you can use to extract uh, things like blue but at test time you'll be predicting blue rather than uh, measuring it against references um, and you end up with some model that you then can use for any number of unseen translations and this is where uh, it, the difference is for this unseen translations you wouldn't need uh, references and uh, of course, if you've trained a model on a given MT system, it will be better at predicting the quality of translations for this, from the same MT system. Um, same applies to the text domain that you use to build the to, to have these examples of translations. If you change the domain, you have issues. But this is just standard as in any machine learning problem. Um, right. So, what is the general approach when uh, we want to build a, a, a quality submission system? Well, we first have to think about what we mean by quality, and that will um, have two implications. So the type of label that we'll collect, uh, or label data, and the level of granularity um, which we will use for these labels. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and then we come up with ways of extracting or learning features, and we choose our favorite machine learning algorithm. So. I mentioned this levels of granularity, and this basically means what uh, kind of input you're going to be giving to your uh, training and also um, 
to your model once it's been built? Is it going to be an entire document or a sentence or a sentence that you want to segment in words or phrases and so on? So you can have all of these possible ways of um, modeling quality estimation. Um, I'm he here I'm showing three levels, uh, so document level, where your scores will be for the entire document. Say you have a zero to one score, score or the higher the better, and it means something like uh, how coherent this document is. Um, you could have each pair of sentences in these documents uh, as, a, as an input for your, for your model. And in this case, again, you could be producing a, a score of any type, for example, a zero to one score, where I could say this means um, how um, adequate the translation is. Or you could actually pr produce a prediction for each given word in this sentence. Um, and the prediction could be, in this case, the example is a binary prediction or either the word is uh, okay, it's correct, or it's bad, meaning it, it would have to be changed or removed or uh, moved around. Um, and you could also have a variant here, which is a phrase level where you're actually doing uh, sequences of words within a sentence, but it's very similar to word level. Right, so just some examples of um, um, labels that you can have. Um, sorry, this we're starting with the, going through each of these levels of granularity um, individually. I'm going to spend more time with sentence level quality estimation and word level quality estimation and briefly just mention the, the others. Um, so starting with sentence level quality estimation, this is sort of the most popular um, type of quality estimation um, work that we have nowadays. There's a lot of work in this area um, and and there's some some ways in which you can vary the the approaches and one of them is like i said before uh, based on what you would be predicting as your quality so these are just some examples there's a lot more that you could think about um, you could think of having say humans um, helping you build this training set for the models by giving you um, specific explicit scores for each sentence for example, uh, a uh, Likert score on a one to N scale for either adequacy, adequacy or fluency, or just even like general quality. Can you tell me how good this set is in one to five? Of course, depending on how subjective your question is, your scores will be more or less meaningful. So the more objective you can be, um, the better the data will be. Excuse me. So, you could also be predicting a um, binary score, good, bad label. You could be predicting um, perceived post-editing effort, so how much effort it would be in, say, one to five to fix this translation. <clears throat> or you could be predicting ranking um, for translations from either the same system or different empty system systems. Um, and you could also have what I call implicit labels, which are labels that are collected as a byproduct of some task. For example, if you're getting the sentences post-edited, then you could measure post-editing time, and then your task would be to predict, say, average time per word in a sentence, or even the post-editing time for the entire sentence. Uh, you could predict, uh, predict sorry, the proportion of edits that are needed in a sentence, or words that need to be changed. Or you could even predict uh, the proportion of keystrokes, or sorry, the average number of keystrokes that are needed for the words in the sentence. So all of this are uh, obviously depend on what you can collect when you're, you're creating your data set, but there are examples of approach that are built using all of this and other quality labels. Um, so once you have this data set uh, annotated at sentence level according to some criterion, the next step is to do some feature engineering. If you still believe that feature engineering is the right way to go, um, or you can do some of that and combine that with some learned uh, features using um, newer models. Um, but I just want to give you an overview of what kinds of features people have used in the past. Um, and some of them are, it, it, they can be learned from data using newer models. Others uh, would be a bit more complicated. You have to do a lot of pre-processing on the data to uh, generate linguistic information and then think about how to generalize that um, to newer models. But Anyway, let's go through the types of features. Um, I've grouped them here in, in four uh, families. So you have always as input, you'd have some source text and its translation after an empty system. 
Um, and you could extract features that come only from the source text. This would be uh, features that tell you how difficult it is to translate the source sentence, such as the length of the source sentence, um, uh, the depth of the synthetic tree of the source sentence. You could have similar features um, on the translation side only, which I call fluency features, which basically measure how how predictable or how expected it is that this translation is a, a valid translation in the target language. Um, for example, you could have a language model score, which is normally very good. Um, or you could have a, a grammaticality check there as well, and many other things. And then we have this other set of features uh, called confidence features that are those that come from the MT system. So when we had statistical systems, for example, you could use the model score or each of the model components in the uh, statistical system, such as uh, word probabilities or phrase probabilities. And this could be features as well. With neuro systems, you could have things like the, um, um, again, you could have the model score, but you could also have uh, the weight vectors from your uh, attention uh, uh, layer and so on. So anything that comes from the empty system, as long as you have access to it. And then finally, you have this adequacy features, which are those that combine the, the source and the translation and try to somehow compare them. For example, uh, the difference in length between the two, um, the difference in, in the uh, number of dependency relations between the two, and many other things that you can do, alignments and so on. Um, Right, I'll give you some examples, more examples of features in a minute. Um, before we, we go there, um, in terms of algorithms, um, you can you could pretty much use off-the-shelf um, algorithms depending on, on the label that you're trying to predict. Um, you could use any regression algorithms such as support vector regression and so on, classification. Uh, people have used kernel methods um, which proved better back then. For example, using tree kernels where you can represent your source text and the translations as partial synthetic trees and then try and learn whether these are expected uh, or good enough uh, partial trees. Um, and of course, more recently, people have started using uh, sequence models such as recurrent neural nets, um, which are richer ways of doing either regression or classification. So we, we have... Um, I'll, I'll talk about this uh, towards the end, but we have been running, uh, and Bravada has been involved in that, we've been running this um, shared task on quality estimation as part of a workshop now conference on machine translation for, for many years now, for seven, eight years. And um, we've been following uh, or using same baseline systems as a, as a way of um, um, having a, a basis for comparison against other systems. Um, this is a shared task, so people submit, um, we, we provide um, shared data and people submit predictions on, on those translations and then we evaluate them and compare the prediction systems. And uh, we always compare them against this baseline system, uh, which is a very, very simple system that has 17 features. And I've just um, given, I think most of them here, um, Things like number of tokens in the source and the target sentences, um, number of occurrences of um, same word uh, in the target sentence, punctuations, language model probability of the source and target sentences, and um, things that uh, words that have been seen in a large corpus of uh, that was used to build the MT system, and, and very simple features, mostly la language independent and uh, not linguistically motivated features. And we use a, an SVM regression algorithm uh, for this baseline system. And I'll show you later uh, how it compares to uh, sort of state-of-the-art approach. Uh, the interesting thing is that in the first year and almost the second year as well, when we ran this task, it was very hard to beat this baseline. And now um, it's very far down in the ranking of systems. Um, but it's known as these, the baseline system for quality estimation. Um, and there is a toolkit that allows extracting this and many other features, 150 features or so, which is called Quest, um, and it's open source, and you can have a look if you're interested. Um, so more advanced features. Again, there are many. I'm just listing some, and I'm not going to read them all. Um, but you could have, um, like I said, three kernels to represent synthetic information of the source and target. You could have word embeddings and some sort of 
way of composing these word embeddings for the entire sentence, or even uh, sentence embeddings nowadays. You could have a score for the coherence of the target sentence, uh, grammaticality of the sentence, and so on. Or you could have no features and just fit um, a network with word embeddings and see what happens. Um, and I'll talk about more advanced um, uh, systems or, or algorithms, sorry, uh, later in the talk, I have a session on sort of the, the most uh, promising approach nowadays, which is a neural net approach. So I'll get to that later. Just so that you know a little bit more about the performance of this uh, models, um, this, this is the result for one language pair for English German of the latest uh, WMT shared task, the one I mentioned before. Uh, which was last year, and here we are predicting HTR. HTR is um, is an automatic metric that is basically the added distance between the machine translation output and a post-edited version by a human of this translation. So it's automatic, but it uses a human post-edited uh, version. So it's a better metric, and what it measures is how much, uh, how what, what's the proportion of edits that would have to be done to fix a translation into a, a correct translation. And it's a score in, in 0 to 1. So as you see in blue, there is our baseline system, the one I mentioned. Uh, the main metric here is Pearson correlation. Um, so the higher the better. And um, you see that there are systems that are doing fairly well. Uh, this post-tech multi-level ensemble is actually the one that I'm going to cover later uh, in more detail. Uh, and then you have a range of other systems doing different things. Uh, Postec is a neural net system, and Babel also uses a neural net, but um, uses some handcraft features. And, and the others um, use a combination of uh, RNNs and handcrafted features in most cases. Um, yeah. We also did a little bit of a comparison with uh, how well systems are doing this year. Uh, com sorry, in 2017 compared, compared to 2016 uh, using the same data. So the training set was a, just a slightly bigger version of previous year's training set. And the test set, we just used the same. So we fixed the test set here and the same language pair. And what you see in, in light blue there are the 2016 systems and 2017 are the ones that are not highlighted and overall they're doing um, much better. So this is also nice to see that there's actually, there has been progress over the, at least the last couple of years in the field. Right, this was it for sentence level for now. Um, I'm going to move on now to document level quality estimation, where um, just, I basically just have a, one slide, I think. Um, and the idea here is that you, you, instead of using a sentence, you're using the entire document, could be a paragraph, could be like a, a full, page, document, or whatever length of uh, text. Um, and the approaches are very similar to the sentence level ones, except that you have a few uh, additional features that try and process the document as a, as a, as a whole. So things like um, cohesion features, which basically uh, try and see how co co uh, cohesive a sentence is within the context of that document. So it will look at some representation of the sentence and representations of adjacent sentences and see if they're um, similar enough, basically. Or you could use a, a, a discourse parser and, and, and count things like what are the number of specific relations in this discourse parser, um, and so on. And in terms of the algorithms, it's, it's basically the same. Um, the problem here with this level of prediction is that it's very hard to collect reliable labels for the entire document. So if you're doing this as a human labeling task to gather training data, you'd basically have to ask a human to give a score for full document, which is um, hard because there'll be parts of the document that are correct and parts that are incorrect. And it's just uh, it's just too difficult task even for humans. So I'm not going to cover much more of that. And the last level of granularity that I, I will cover is the word level prediction. Um, so in this case, you're predicting a label for every single word in a sentence or a, doesn't matter in a document and so on. Um, for some applications, this is important. Um, for example, if you have people fixing translations, uh, both editing them, you might want to indicate clearly where the errors are so that they make sure they, they fix those errors so they don't miss anything. 
Um, also, if you have readers, um, and this is a gisting application, if you have readers um, trying to process the sentence, it would be good to inform them of which regions of the sentence they cannot trust uh, because they're not good enough. So, uh, at, in ge generally speaking, this is a more challenging task. Uh, for various reasons um, compared to sentence level. I mean, um, first, um, you need more data because you basically have um, very many different words and you're trying to predict the quality for different words in context, so you have a lot of uh, sparsity. Um, you normally have a very skewed distribution towards the good label if you're treating this as a binary task of good versus bad. Um, um, empty systems are pretty good nowadays, so you have a few words in a sentence that are bad and most of them that are good. So it's it's hard to learn from this data. And also errors tend to be interdependent, so they're not normally isolated with few exceptions. So if you see an error, um, it may be a consequence of other error in the sentence. And if you fix that other error, then maybe you wouldn't have this uh, second error. Um, there has been some work on trying to mitigate some of this uh, issue, especially the interdependency between word error levels, uh, errors, uh, which is to model the problem as a phrase level prediction task, um, where if you have a way of segmenting a sort of sentence into phrases, then you could assign a label per phrase, even though seemingly only one or two words in this phrase could be wrong, but the entire phrase is part of the context that makes that wrong. Um, this made more sense in the Era of um, statistical MT. Now with neuro MT, we don't have the concept of phrase as well defined. So again, I'm not going to cover this phrase level variant uh, in this talk. So what do I mean by predicting uh, word uh, level errors or uh, labels? So the simplest way of doing that is the good bad label, like I said. Um, it could also predict types of edits. Um, do I need to replace this word? Do I need to delete it? Or can I keep it? And this is just a, a representation of these two variants. So the binary label would be the good, bad, or keep, change. It's the same. And the multi-class would be the keep, delete, um, uh, shift, meaning here, uh, move around, and so on. So it really depends on, on the kind of data that you have and how you label this uh, training data. Um, but the simplest thing you can do is um, what we do for these tasks, which is we basically take um, a human post-edit version, which here have been yellow into Spanish, um, and then I can align the machine translation and the human post-edit version at the word level. And every word that doesn't align, um, I know it's uh, incorrect, so I'll label it as bad. Um, this, this is what we most people do nowadays. A more advanced approach could actually have data that is annotated for very specific error types. Um, here I'm showing an example of what we call multidimensional quality metrics, or MQM. And it basically has different, uh, 20 or so different types of errors. Um, and if you have data labeled in that way, then you could predict the actual type of error. Is it a mistranslation, an omission, and so on. Of course, this, is, this requires human annotation of the, the errors. Um, and you need a lot more data because, again, you have a lot more different uh, types of classes to predict, uh, not just two. And it's, it would give you a very rich type of uh, error detection, but it's very expensive to produce uh, data for. Um, so once you have defined what the labels will be like um, and you have your data, then the choice of algorithm is um, basically these two classes. Uh, sequence labeling, um, such as CRF, or you could even think of uh, other sequence algorithms, um, where the label of a given word um, is dependent on uh, features, but also on the label of um, neighboring words. So, um, and this is very uh, uh, well covered by things like uh, conditional random fields. Or you could have classification algorithms where each word is labeled independently from the labels of other words. You can still use other words as context and, and in, in the form of features, but you're not looking at the labels of other words in, in when building your model. Right. Um, in terms of features that have been used, this is again uh, our baseline set of features. 
that we've been using for this shared task. Um, so features are at the word level here, so you can look at the word itself, um, such as the target word is the word that we want to predict the quality for, uh, the context of this word, so left and right words or left and right bigrams, or um, a few counts, such as the number of tokens in the source sentence, even though, though this applies to all of the words in the, in the sentence, whether or not the target word is a specific type of thing, like a stop word or punctuation, and so on. Um, and we've been using CRF as, a, as an algorithm for baseline classification. Um, you can extract this and many other features for word level of prediction using a different uh, toolkit that we also made available um, in, 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 um, in the GitHub rep here, and it's called Marmot. Um, again, if you're thinking of more advanced features, then you could look at linguistically motivated features, such as dependency relation between a target word and the head, of, head word in the sentence, um, some sort of translation probability between the word that is aligned to this target word in the source sentence, and so on. And again, you could use uh, some word embedding representation rather than uh, crafting features here. And I'm going to once again talk about this more complex approach using neural nets later, because it's actually the same approach for word level and sentence level prediction. To give you an idea of the performance of uh, models, uh, this is again from last year's WMT task. Um, so we have the same system performing the top, and it's exactly the same system, which you can switch or alternate between predicting lab labels for words or sentences. Um, and you have a baseline which is somewhere halfway or a bit lower. And again, you have uh, different systems. Um, there's one that's interesting here. This disuse system uses um, an automatic post-editing approach to do quality estimation, and I'll, I'll mention that later. And this is comparison with the year before uh, systems on the same test set. And as you can see, in 2017, the systems did better than the year before, over, over generally speaking, the top systems at least. Um, just one thing that I haven't mentioned here, the metric here that we use for performance, it's a classification task. So and we have labels that are good or bad. So we have the F measure for good and bad here. Um, but we also have this metric that is the main metric, which is basically a multiplication of these two, the bad and good. Um, or okay, and this is a way of um, getting rid of systems that are uh, very good at predicting either bad or or, or good labels, and uh, basically disregard the other class. Um, but you see that generally speaking, all of the systems are much better at predicting the okay label because this is the uh, class that has a lot more representation in the data. It's a very skewed. Uh, um, annotation here because most words are actually good. And I haven't mentioned this, but this is all on statistical machine translation output data, all of these uh, experiments that I've showed so far. Right, so this, um, most of the work that I, I mentioned uh, has been done on top of um, statistical systems, the shared tasks for sure. Um, and recently we started looking at uh, the output of newer MT systems, um, and like I said, also um, how we can build newer models for any type of translation. So I'm going to cover these two topics now. Um, some of this work is um, it's been done by somewhere someone else, and this is um, the best system that um, performed better at uh, all of the tasks in WMT17. And I'm going to refer to it as the Postec model. Postec is the institute that, sub that submitted the system. Um, and I'm going to do my best to cover it here, but um, you'd better read the paper to kind of get a better understanding of uh, what the system actually does. This is the reference. Um, so they, they did a very clever thing, which is um, a way of addressing uh, the lack of training data for uh, quality estimation. So to give you an idea of what sizes we normally have, uh, for sentence level prediction, um, it's about uh, 20,000, 30,000 sentences which is good enough if you're training a, a support vector machine, but it's not good enough if you're training a recurrent neural net, for example. Um, 
and then putting something on top of that uh, to to give you a, a prediction. So what these people have done is they split the problem in two and they have this they come up with um, this uh, architecture called the, the predictor estimator approach um, where uh, each of these component components it's currently um, initially they had them trained independently but now they're trained jointly but you could think of them independently at first um, so the predictor is basically sort of, uh, you can think of it as almost a pre-processing step, except that they train them jointly nowadays. But what it does is it takes a lot of uh, training data that is not labeled for quality. Uh, it's actually data that is uh, source and reference translation. So it's human translation. And then tries to get a better uh, an understanding of um, what kinds of uh, representations are considered good representations because they are extracted from this sort of data, which is source and human translation, which are aligned at the sentence level. Um, so this predictor uh, approach basically, or, or, or model generates some sort of a representation, some vectors that we then fit into the second model, the estimator, which is trained on quality estimation data. So, and, and this, you could think of these vectors as features that are then used for the estimator. So I'm going to try and cover this too uh, in a bit more detail now. And I, love, I have a lot of details on the slides, uh, which I just put there in case you want to try and implement this, because um, we did a lot of work trying to um, process the paper and, 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 um, and understand it. So all the papers, because there are a few. So um, these are both RNNs. Uh, the predictor is an encoder-decoder RNN. Um, it's a, the more complex part of the, the, the framework. Um, and it's basically trained to predict words based on their context. So um, you could think of it as, as a sort of a, 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 the training part of a neuro MT system. And the estimator is also an RNN, but it's a unidirectional one. And it's just one. And it's trained to predict quality labels. And they actually, the way they do these things jointly, I'll get to that, but they basically use um, uh, multi-stack propagation so that they can propagate the errors of the estimator all the way to the predictor. So this is standard notation. Um, again, I left on the, on the slide so that you can understand the equations, but you'd have the, the one-hot vectors for the uh, source sentence. We're talking about the predictor here. So you have the one-hot sentences, uh, sorry, vectors for the source sentences. Um, and then you have the same for the translated sentences. And again, we're training this on, on reference, so it's not empty sentence, but reference sentence. Um, and then there is a word in this reference sentence that um, you're trying to predict the vectors for, say yj. And then you have the context of um, this yj. So the, the preceding context, so the first y uh, left arrow and this um, succeeding con context, so y uh, right arrow. So this is the basic input for the predictor. And uh, let's see if there's anything else here. No. And the architecture is as follows. So this is a complex architecture. It's actually quite time consuming to train. Um, uh, but what you have is um, you have your source sentence here, which I'm calling original sentence. And then you have your, I'm calling it machine translation, but it's trained, like I said, on reference translation. So you have a reference translation here. And at test time, uh, um, you'd be applying this to machine translation, but at this training of the predictor is using reference translation. Um, so you have one RNN for, um, well, we have two actually, you have bidirectional RNNs for the original sentence. Uh, you have the usual uh, embedding layers. So these are word embeddings for uh, both the source sentence and the translation sentence. Um, and, and then you have this preceding and succeeding context vectors uh, uh, for the translation sentence. Um, and for the encoder-decoder approach, you also have a tension. And so this, this bit, uh, the first um, um, part of the, the, the architecture, you can think of it, like I said, as, as, a, as a training of a neuro MT. You have your context, source context ve vector here. Um, that you're going to use together with other um, things coming from this uh, preceding and succeeding uh, context vectors of the target language. 
So let me uh, go through the explanation and I'll come back to the architecture. So this is sort of the, the input. You have embeddings for all of this, uh, for the source and translated sentences represented in, in, in different ways. Um, and you generate this context vector for the source sentence. And um, yeah, this is all the notation that we use in case you, you need to refer to it. Um, let me see what I haven't mentioned yet. So, yeah, basically what we're doing is we combine this context vector CJ of the source with the embeddings of the words that preceded it and succeed it. And we're doing this combination using uh, the output of a, a forward RNN for the preceding words and a, a backward RNN for the succeeding words. Um, and there is some projection happening there so that we can have everything in the same uh, dimensionality. And then basically we're summing this representation. So we have this, uh, if I go back to the architecture, uh, from each of these uh, networks, we get uh, um, different matrices, uh, which are in the same dimensionality. And then we're basically summing this. And this gives us what we call the intermediate, intermediate context representation. Um, to this context representation, we can uh, apply a max up layer and get a final context representation. Uh, and this final context representation is, is what we actually use to predict, well, sorry, to estimate the probability of um, a given target word given the source context, which is the second uh, uh, bit here. So given the source context and the left and right context of the target word in the target language. So this would be sort of the final uh, output of, of the predictor, um, except that we are not really interested in the final probability. So if we wanted to know what, how likely it is that a given word happens um, in a translation, given the source and the context in this translation, then this is what we would be doing, we would be looking at this probability. But actually, this is not what um, they do. Um, they're not interested in the, the probability, but they're interested in the final, sorry, in the sort of byproducts of this process. So, and this is what they call this quality um, vectors. Um, and they have two of these types, two types of quality vectors. Um, and they are, uh, one of them is almost, it's the unnormalized probability. So it's basically this nominator here before any normalization or marginalization. Um, so this is what they call the pre-quality uh, uh, vectors for the, the, the YJ word. Um, and the other one is what they call the post-quality um, vectors. And these are basically, um, I put a definition there. So uh, I've already talked about the pre-quality vector, which is this unnormalized probability estimate of the word given the source and the target context. Um, and the, the, the post quality vector is the, so it's the concatenation of the uh, hidden states of both the forward and the backward RNN. So basically the context of the target language only. So independent on the source uh, language here. So these two representations, the post and the pre quality feature vectors, quality estimation feature vectors, that's what they call them, are what they then pass forward to the next part of the model, which is the estimator. So the estimator is a simpler architecture. It's a bidirectional uh, RNN that will take as input these two vector representations, and it will produce uh, labels for word or phrase or sentence level, whatever you did at training time. So um, this is the actual estimation part. Um, this is the, the sort of the architecture of, of the estimator. So you fit in a sequence of all of this quality estimation feature vectors of the two types, so the pre and the post. Um, you fit that into a bidirectional RNN, and this RNN is trained to predict um, either good and bad labels for words, or some good and bad labels for phrases in this case, or a sentence level score, which in the case of the task was HDR. So you could you could do this each of this independently, or you could do what they did, which is a multitask learning, where you kind of alternating. Uh, you're doing batches of the training, and in one batch you're uh, uh, predicting uh, word level errors, and you're updating your model based on the the predictions that you make and the errors that you make there. So you're propagating based on 
the errors that you make for word level prediction. And then this next batch, you train for phrase level and so on. So the usual way of doing most task learning in, in, in um, RNN or in, in neural models. And the other thing that I mentioned is that they are able to propagate the errors here all the way to the predictor model. Uh, and they do that by using this stack propagation method, um, which is fairly standard as well nowadays. Right. So I have a few experiments showing um, how well these models do on, we've already seen some numbers for the shared task, but um, here I also want to show how well they do on neuro MT data, not only SMT data. So what we have is a very nice data set, which actually has source sentences that are translated by both statistical systems and neuro systems, or actually one system each type, uh, one statistical and one neuro. And then all of these translations are post-edited by professional translators and so on. Um, and, and then we, we're predicting HTR for sentences and we're predicting good and bad labels for words. Um, and these are just some numbers about the training set uh, and the test set and so on. Uh, the only thing that matters here is that if you look at the blue and red uh, numbers, these are the scores for the machine translations um, before I do any quality estimation here. Um, of statistical systems versus neural systems. So HDR, the lower the better because it's an error metric. So you see that uh, neural translation model on this, which is trained on exactly the same data as this, this statistical model, is able to get much better translation. So um, only 9% of the words in the entire data set were actually edited, whereas 24% of the words approximately were edited for statistical MT. In terms of size of training, we have 28,000 sentences and about almost 500,000 words. So it's, it's fairly big. Um, and what we're going to do is to look at how this, um, how systems perform on these two variants of the data, statistical versus neural. Uh, we started with looking at the baseline system. So these were the systems that I mentioned before, the WMT systems for sentence and word level. And you have in, in, in each table we have SMT translations and neuro MT translations. And you see that uh, by a, a very large margin, the predictors are better for SMT data because as, as I mentioned before, there are more errors there. So it's, it's not such a skewed distribution. And um, this is particularly true for word level where you have very few words um, that are bad. Um, so we did a, another Kind of small experiment where we simply removed all of the sentences that had no edits, so there's no zero HDR, is a subset of the training set and test set where you're getting rid of sentences that didn't have any edits. And then the scores go up um, for NeuroMT because it had more zeros, not for SMT, um, except a little bit here. But anyway, it just means that uh, the usual way of doing quality estimation based on, on, on algorithms such as SVM and CRF, um, it suffers um, considerably from the skew distribution of the data where you have too many translations that are good. Um, so we did the same with the post-tech model. Uh, and in this case, we did not remove the zero HTR sentences because it would make the data significantly smaller. Um, and we trained a few variants of the model. Uh, the first one here is, um, this is a small model that's only trained to predict sentence level. So it's not multitask learning. It's not learning from word labeling or, or phrase labeling, just sentence labeling. Um, and um, if you compare 046 and 029 with what we had here, 031 and 013, you see that the difference is massive. So in fact, the, the, the post-tech model does a lot better. And this is with training. Um, so the predictor is trained on Europarl. So this large um, uh, training uh, set parallel corpus, which has about I don't know, one point, one and a half million sentence pairs. Uh, and the estimator is only trained on the quality estimation data. And then we started adding to the architecture. So we did the multitask learning. So we have both word level and sentence level prediction trained jointly with a single layer. And then we started making it more complicated 
adding, I think it's two layers here, um, and the scores go up. Um, and then we pre-trained, well, sorry, we trained the predictor on a much larger uh, training set, reference uh, parallel corpus, um, which includes all of the WMT English German data, and the scores go up even more. So this shows the potential of this post-tech approach um, to it's already better even on the small data without multitask learning and it gets much better if you if you use a more complex architecture and the same applies to word level um, in the first case here we're only doing the prediction of word level without multitask learning um, and 28 versus 19 is sort of better than what we had here 23 versus 009 um, but we are able to make it a little better by adding more layers to the network to making it multitask learning and training the predictor on more data. Um, right, so almost done. Um, so just a few points that I, I, um, I haven't mentioned. Um, yeah, data was supposed to just have a few numbers there, but basically I've already mentioned the, the sort of the scale of the data sets that we have. Um, so about 30,000 uh, sentences, which is large, um, uh, larger than what we have been using in previous years. Um, but in terms of a neural model, you'd think that that's quite small, but we showed that with the post system, we can actually do a lot by pre-training this on, on reference data. Um, with neural MT data, it's harder to, to spot errors because the translations are generally very fluent. So not only you have all of these cases that uh, have no edits at all in your training data, uh, because they're all very good, but also even in the cases where you have edits, um, generally speaking, uh, the translations are fluent. We all know that for neural MT because the model is pretty much a language model, um, the decoder model. And uh, that means that all of the features that we used to use before, uh, language model features and other contextual features are not as efficient or effective anymore. Um, and there was a, a point that I made about um, quality estimation versus automatic post editing. So one of the top systems last year's um, in last year's task actually did basically treat the task of quality estimation as a post editing task. So you learn a post editing an automatic post editing model from uh, um, sentences that are um, machine translated sentences versus their post edited version. And, and then you apply the automatic post editor to a new machine translation system. And you basically just see how many words were edited after the, the automatic post editing with respect to the original um, uh, machine translation. And all of the words that were edited, you consider them as uh, bad words. And simply by simply doing that, it seems that uh, you can go very far already. It's not as good as a post tech system, but it goes a long way. So this is interesting because you basically instead of just pinpointing errors and saying there are errors here and there, you're actually fixing the errors and then uh, showing where the errors were. So this is also a promising direction. Um, and if you're interested um, and want to get involved, um, this is a bit of a propaganda. So we have another edition of the WMT shared task coming this year. Um, and it, it, the data is not there yet, but it will be very soon. There will be word and sentence level tracks um, using this neural data that I just mentioned, plus SMT data, so people can compare the two if they want. Um, and these are specific domains, IT and medical. The number of sentences is pretty high, up to 40,000. Um, and they have HDR scores for sentences and good and bad labels for words in a few language combinations, English into and from German, uh, English into Latvian or Czech. And we're doing an additional task, which is very new, which is uh, quality estimation on the Amazon product review data set. So we'll have uh, uh, annotations done at the word level there manually at a very large scale. This will be the largest data set with manually annotated word errors that we've ever seen. So at least 20,000 sentences, um, about 200,000 words on descriptions of products and um, titles of products in the Amazon uh, review data set uh, from English to French. So the task will be to predict specific word level errors such as mistranslation, omission and so on. So this will be available soon as well. 
So to conclude, um, so I, I started talking about machine translation and evaluation more in general um, before quality estimation. Uh, it's still an open problem, as I'm sure you're aware. A lot of people will use metrics like blue, and this, that's where they will stop. But we know that they don't tell us enough, and we know that they cannot be used for um, systems in use on the fly. Um, we also know that if we if we know what the purpose of the MT system is uh, and who's going to use it, we can have better ways of modeling uh, quality than just matching words against reference. And quality estimation allows us to do that, both to, to model quality the way we want in a tailored way, but also to learn metrics that can then be used um, on the fly. Um, there are many questions that you could ask, and I'm going to put here the questions in case you don't have questions to ask, um, but um, we can have a discussion on that. So, is it helpful in practice? Are companies using it? Uh, where is the field moving to? And so on. So, that is it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, there is actually one question that I was going to ask. Uh, are companies really using it? Because uh, I remember many people saying, uh, actually, Maxim Khalilov, which uh, gave a lecture for us the other day, he said that it's very promising and they are going to use it. But um, I'm a bit skeptical about that. What, what do you think? Is it really usable mm, today in the present state of, uh, of the field? Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. I know of companies that do use it, but um, they use simpler versions of it. Uh, for example, um, a language, a big language service provider, shouldn't mention the name because they might not like it. But um, when um, I mean they were using machine uh, statistical machine translation until recently, and what they were doing, just to give an example, is that they were taking very simple uh, features and they were not building a, a prediction model. They were rather just extracting these features from the sentences and then using, uh, and its features are language model scores, length of the sentence, very simple things. And then they were using this to rank translations to decide um, if they had like a large uh, job um, and they needed to optimize the, the time in which they were able to deliver batches of this job. Um, to decide which of these sentences to post edit first or to uh, fix first. And they seem to find that very effective. And and then I know of many companies that are interested in it, but they've been um, stumbling across different issues. For example, if they want to use something as complex as the post tech architecture, um, first there is no open source code for it, so they have to re-implement it, which is not super easy. Uh, we managed to do it, but it was um, uh, took a couple of weeks to understand it and then implement it and test it and so on. Um, and then there are no guarantees that this will work. So I think people are still thinking that they need better quality predictions to be able to trust on the predictions. Uh, but this is if you're actually using this in a fully automated way. If you're just using it to inform the translator somehow or to rank the translations and then still Post edit all of them. Then I think it's it's uh, there are people using it, and there are experiments that show that uh, it's effective to do it, uh, even with simpler models such as some of the uh, um, um, not the top performance uh, ones in the task, but sort of the average ones. But I think I think we're not there yet. You're right. We still need to make these models better so they are more reliable. Okay. Thanks. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Um, okay, I'll, uh, I'll then ask a question, uh, another question myself. I remember uh, there were some early works on predicting uh, the adequacy versus fluency errors uh, in, in, in machine translated sentences, but as far as I remember, they were not successful. But now, after looking at some examples you provided, I actually understood that it might be probably even more important to be able to predict specifically adequacy errors and yeah. just to ignore the rest. Uh, do you know it would be possible anytime soon? And have you heard of any work in, in this direction? 
Um, no, and this is basically where I think the field will be moving because it will be if you try, if you're estimating the output or the quality of the output of neural systems, then fluency is not an issue anymore. So you can either ignore that or just assume that this is already a given that the sentence will be fluent, um, and then really focus on on adequacy issues. Um, but it it is critical to do it. Um, for many reasons, because adequacy has always been easier, harder to capture because you basically need to compare the source and the target and they're in different languages. Um, I think um, my intuition is that uh, the post-tech model or models that look at um, representations of source and target like they do actually are a good step in that direction. Whether we need more uh, elaborate models that uh, look at very specific uh, adequacy related phenomena, like whether you're missing a word, which something we know happens in your MT. Also, you insert words when you shouldn't have them there. So th I think it will be a combination of just use using um, either things like bilingual embedding representations or, or some form of uh, concatenation of source and target uh, representations with some more um, sort of uh, explicit modeling of things that we know near MT uh, errors they make that made the sentence less uh, adequate, such as insertion and deletion of words. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, another call for questions? Okay, it looks like people are a bit um, puzzled by quality estimation. So I, I'll just ask one last question, which uh, will be a bit tricky, maybe. Um, I, I have heard many people being very skeptical about quality estimation in general, and in particular word level quality estimation. They said that mm -hmm. once you can solve word level quality estimation, it means that you can solve machine translation completely. So it's no uh, reason for doing that. So what uh, what can you say in defense of word level quality estimation? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's always been the f a question that I get. Um, like, if you can detect errors, and if you can, um, yeah. So the word level, if you can detect errors, why can't you solve them and just fix the MT in the first place, so it doesn't produce those errors anymore? I think one key difference there is when you're predicting things, you have access to a lot more information. So in the old days, when you're extracting features, you could look at um, the context of the translation um, and extract things like, uh, I don't know, a uh, language model of the the word based on its immediate context or so. And now it's, it's the same with the approach like uh, the post tech because you're actually looking at the preceding but also succeeding context in the MT, which you wouldn't have if you're generating the words. You would not have generated those the succeeding words yet. So I think it remains the case that you have access to more information. So you should be better at predicting than producing translations um, in theory. But um, if you at least get more insight on what exactly is hel helping in the prediction uh, at the word level, then that could be insightful on how and, and try and, and improve the models. But I don't think you can directly use whatever you learn uh, in the prediction models as a way of improving the translation models. Okay, thank you. So we've run out of time. So let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.